much for the uh, introduction. So what has made America so great? So what's the secret? What were the ideals that have lifted up these 13 colonies with so many divides between them, and so many issues to be the biggest world power to date? And most importantly, what is going to happen with America and its so-called genius? These questions we are going to discuss today with our distinguished guests. Please welcome Mr. Janos Cák, who is the Minister of Culture and Innovation in Hungary, dealing with many areas, including also higher education and entrepreneurship. He has been the CEO of more transnational companies, including the Hungarian Mall Group, and he also served as the ambassador of Hungary to the United Kingdom between 2011 and 2014. Please also welcome Mr. Patrick Denin, uh, who is a, prof a professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame. He studies and writes about political thought, especially about American liberal democracy. Uh, his book, Why Liberalism Failed, has been translated to 12 languages, including Hungarian. Dear Minister, dear Professor, welcome. So, uh, let me just begin. For the first question, uh, I would like to quote the last sentence of the book in question, The American Genius. So, Minister, you, you say that we should keep an eye on America. What motivated you to write the book? So, why do you pay such a special attention to the United States in your publication? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. It's a privilege to be here on this stage with Professor Dinin. Uh, I would say, I don't tell you why I think, because you should buy my book and read it. <laughs> but uh, we should keep an eye on, on the US for two reasons. One is that clearly the United States of America is the leader of the Western world, the Western civilization, and uh, it's an agile power where thoughts, ideas, translated into products and, uh, and reality in an unprecedentedly fast way. And this has been a characteristic for the US for the last 235 years and even before. The other thing why we should keep an eye on the US because the US is unique is a unique place because, uh, because of their tradition of legalistic thinking, they translate each and every problem, personal, business, political problem, into legal fights. And uh, in these legal debates or fights, uh, they basically boil down the, the issues to the core. And what we have seen over the last 40, four decades was a debate approaching the f most fundamental question for human beings. What do we mean about human life? The abortion. And now, a couple of weeks ago, the Supreme Court, after this long, long intellectual and, and uh, academic and, and public debate, they decided. So my argument in the book is that we have to keep an eye on the US, which still delivers some 25% of the world's GDP. The only military power who can uh, uh, conduct military actions anywhere in the world in multiple places. And thirdly, we know the intellectual uh, global market and the arts and, and others, the US is still the most wanted, the most desirable place for people to learn to study, to sell art. So economically, militarily, and academically and arts-wise, culturally, I reluctantly say this, is still the leading power of, of the Western world, and Europe can jump up and, uh, and jump down, doesn't seem to, to match up with what the, what the US can do. May I ask the, you guys 
taking pictures that no one can see this stage because you are standing between the audience and us. Thank you, if, if it's possible. Thank you. So, thank you. So, dear professor, what do you think is the main aspect which made America so great and why the entire world should keep an eye on America? Well, I think it's, uh, I, I agree with everything uh, the ambassador has just said. Um, for all of those reasons, uh, uh, we should keep an eye on America because of its power, because of its influence. Um, I also think there's a question which is before us, which is what, in what ways is America great and is it great? Uh, in other words, I think we can recognize on the level of economic, on the level of uh, military, uh, cultural influence, there is something undeniably great, if we use that word in one sense. But there's another sense in which we might understand the word great, which is, is it admirable? Is it something we should imitate? Should its principles and ideals be uh, the universal principles of the entire world? And I think that right now we are in the middle of a great debate uh, in the Western world about what those values are, whether they are universal, and whether they can be sustained over a long period of time. These are debates that we're having within the United States right now, seeing that we are facing challenges internally, politically, as you are probably all aware, uh, that really do lead to the question of whether or not what we have taken to be what is admirable about America is something that can be internally sustainable. And I'll just mention, I'll just mention two things, I suppose. One of the great things about America, of course, is if we define greatness in a certain way, is its economic power, its prosperity. But we also know that that prosperity is, at the current moment, is manifested, is presented in a very deep, deeply divisive and unequal way. There are many people uh, who, make a, who are very wealthy because of the American economic system. But there are a greater number of people who no longer feel like they are included in that circle of prosperity. Uh, and one of the great divisions of American society today is, in some ways, the very consequence of its greatness, of its success. Then the, the, the other aspect we could talk more about if we wanted is, of course, the military aspect, uh, which is um, the ability to be able to fight a war, uh, to, to engage militarily anywhere, has been one of the defining features of the United States since the end of World War II. Uh, and it has, ex it has expended a great deal of its wealth in building a global military power. But this project is increasingly something that is of concern to Americans who don't believe that they should simply be, in some ways, the policemen of the world. And we saw this is also a source of internal division. So I think one really interesting thing about the ambassador's book is that he recognizes that we keep an eye on America because the very things that make it great also cause internal tensions uh, and divisions that will be felt in the rest of the world. That's an interesting question if America could really be considered only great, or whether if there is another side. And if there is another side, which is more a negative aspect of the story, do you think that it's more with the ideals, the founding ideals of the United States from the beginning? Or do you think that the problem is that America left its ideals, uh, or at least changed them in a way that, uh, that uh, decreases the greatness of America? So what do you think about this? Well, one of the things I really admire, and I just want to say to those of you, uh, and I'm sorry that I can't speak Hungarian because I really want to emphasize this. Uh, this is really one of the finest books I have read about my own country in the last 10 years, uh, in the last decade. Uh, and I read a lot of books. Uh, America has always been blessed um, by the insights of visitors from other countries who help us to see ourselves. I like to use the image of the fish in the, in the fish bowl 
uh, which swims around and doesn't know what it's swimming in. It, does, it can't see the water that it swims in. And so it's always, uh, America has always benefited from uh, foreign visitors, perceptive and intelligent foreign visitors uh, who see clearly the nature of our country and help explain it to us. And I read, I read the ambassador's book uh, very much in the spirit. And so it is, he is an heir of someone who appears often in his book, Alexis de Tocqueville, who was one of the first great uh, visitors who taught America about what we are. And one of the things that um, the ambassador, uh, I think, very nicely discusses in this book is how the American, the genius of America, is in some ways born of a very productive tension between, a, you could say, a Christian founding, its first founding, which were the Puritans who came from England and from throughout Europe, to find in America a haven where they could worship. And that America was the land where they could freely find uh, or seek their God together in communities. But there's another aspect of the American founding, which is a kind of enlightenment tradition. The, the idea and belief that we as human beings make ourselves and make our futures through our own efforts and our own exertions. I would say that one of the things that makes America, if, if it's a genius, if there's a genius to America, has been this tension has been a productive tension. Neither of them becoming too, let's say, too uh, defining or limiting of what it was to be an American. Uh, both our understanding of ourselves as a Christian nation and also as an Enlightenment nation. And I would say that one of the stories that uh, Ambassador uh, uh, tells uh, in the book is how gradually the kind of the pre-modern, the pre-Enlightenment foundations of America have been sort of weakened over time. Uh, and how the kind of Enlightenment tradition, and especially its secular version, has become more dominant. So that tension has been dissolved in ways that I think we can see today uh, in the United States, how a kind of materialistic, um, individualistic, self-seeking, um, uh, solipsistic, selfish um, understanding has become dominant. And so one of the things that in reading your book uh, in its conclusion is, can America find its way back to reconstituting that very essential and necessary sort of cooperative tension between its different foundings? <clears throat> yeah. So I love America. And uh, what I love is the, is the still today the frontier spirit searching and as we know our individual lives our family lives our, our nation's life is always a struggle there has never been arcadia there has never been a golden age it's coping with the challenges what what comes uh, in front of us america is the best example how to tackle the problems which a country or a family or a nation uh, should. And what is admirable uh, about America, in my opinion, is that they always redigest the meaning of what are the human goods. And Professor Dineen is a ancient Greece and, and Roman scholar, as we know, the Romans and the, and the Greeks, the Greek philosophers started thinking about, can, can we define universal human goods? And one is uh, attachment. We all need attachments, we all need belonging. One of the reasons of the crisis of the US now, that this belief that there is a entity, the United, United States of America, is a worthwhile place to stay and to belong to. 
when kids don't refuse to sing the anthem, the U.S. anthem in the schools, that, that, that is shaky. So the belonging and the attachment, which is universal, timeless and spaceless uh, uh, human need, human good, is, 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 is in jeopardy. The second one is the ability to care. We all love to care uh, our loved ones and maybe the bigger community. And we want to have freedom to decide how we care about ourselves and, and our friends, our families, our nation. That is again, as the professor alluded to it, uh, is shaken in the US because the, sh the US is the most uh, materially and economically unequal country in the OECD countries. Uh, out of the 36 countries, the US is the last but Turkey. So we have the attachment, our source, we have the care, our material life, and, and thirdly, we have our, our wish, desire, want to be in, in security, in peace. And also the professor alluded to that in the US, if you, if you, if you look at what is happening in the US and you have to hit the road, for example, in, in Ohio, Route 15, you don't want to open the door of your car. And there are many places in the US uh, as such. And the security and, and uh, the peace, think about Portland or other places, it, it's also shaken. And peace and security, ability to care, attachment, belonging, these are timeless human goods. And in the US, what I enjoy reading and, and seeing, next week I will be over there, is how do they cope, how they can reestablish uh, human goods. And I think the founding ideas, liberty, ordered liberty, equality before the law and justice are the best ever features of a genius which if works well, can deliver these human goods. And the, delivering the human goods is the name of the game, name of the competition amongst nations. So this is why we should root for the, for the Americans, that they find the spirit, the founding spirit of the genius to deliver, deliver human goods. Thank you. So, dear minister, I would like to ask about uh, how America um, <clears throat> relates to these universal human goods and one of them is a uh, connection that you mentioned to other people and also you mentioned equality before the law but you also write in your book uh, about having these backlashes especially uh, with Native American people and black people throughout American history and uh, so how, what do you think can be the cause what do you think would be the main cause for this uh, kind of self-contradiction and also this question can also relate to Christianity because it has m been mentioned by the professor that America has a Christian heritage but I have had some good debates before with my fellow law students about America be being a secular kind of uh, democracy separating from the Brits and separating from a religious state so how do you think these contradictions could be resolved okay for the two questions very short uh, First of all, there is a big debate whether the U.S. is a Christian culture the, uh, country or not. I think the U.S., because there are so many people there from all over the world, the U.S., I think, is a, as it was taught to be, a moral and religious country. There was a Gallup uh, uh, poll recently that almost 90% of the US population still believes that they are religious. But we shouldn't think about only the Christian God. We believe, I deeply believe uh, in, in, in God. But why, if, if we call it him or her almighty, something that is above the human will, about the human uh, uh, control. Anybody who believes in that, be it an Asian, a Latin American, an African, 
they are my comrades. Because the dividing line is between the people who believe that there is something bigger than man and, and we are kept together or maybe created by that, that big something which we should aspire to, to measure up or there are those who don't believe. And it's really hard to have, conduct a, a good conversation with, with, with those people. So that's about the religiousness. And for any society to be successful, religion and moral foundations are inescapable. The second is the contradictions in the US. I call it in the book, cognitive dissonance. It's a psychological concept, which means that you act in a way which is against your believed belief system. And to reconcile the two, you start uh, changing your perception of reality and facts. So uh, I quote a Nobel Prize winner economist, Mirdal, in 1947, I guess, he wrote a book about the segregation, white-black segregation in the US, and he said that, how funny that uh, uh, deeply believing Christian people who believe that they follow the Ten Commandments and, and live a, a truthful life to God, they can behave entirely differently towards the black people. So it's a, and they still believed that they are good Christians. So that's the cognitive dissonance. And you can, the US military actions are, are great examples that we are, they say that they are expanding the democracy and the rule of law in, in the world and the justice, and they are doing exactly the opposite. That, that is, you know, politely cognitive dissonance. Uh, so I, I highlight examples for this in the book, and as a human being, cannot live long in a state of cognitive dissonance. It's a question how a social entity can do that. So I, I, I actually want to challenge the assumptions of both of the questions in some ways. I don't mean this to be disagreeable. Uh, the first is that, um, is the idea, I think you were saying you had a conversation with a friend that America is increasingly a secular country. And I don't think America has ever been a secular country. Uh, what people identify as being secular is actually profoundly religious. And all you need to do today is to walk around on an American, in an American city and see the new symbols of our new religion. It's a rainbow flag, um, it has its orthodoxy, it has its heresy, it has all the features of a religious belief, and it's actually, in a kind of way, it's a new formulation of a certain kind of Christian view of the world. There are, the, there are those who, have, um, uh, who are endowed with a certain grace, there are those who are sinners, uh, if you are a sinner, you need to ask for forgiveness. So much of what you see today in the American culture wars is a reflection of a kind of uh, a transference of a traditional Christian view into a new kind of, let's say, theological political form. So I don't think what we're seeing is strictly speaking secular. If, that, if, if it was just secular, it would just be a bunch of materialists running around without any value system. Um, and I think in some ways, part of the clash today is a clash between people who have one theological view of the world, which is the old classical Christian understanding, and a new theological view of the world, which is a, which is a kind of a form of progressivism that believes we can create the kingdom of heaven on earth. So it is a kind of clash of theologies rather than a clash of the theological versus the secular. That, that would just be the first thing I would just suggest that keep an eye on because I think this is one of the reasons why it's so difficult today for in American politics for there to be any kind of compromise because it is really a genuinely a vision of two fundamentally different theologies in a way rather than just a difference of political views. And I guess on the question, uh, uh, the ambassador spends a very um, 
important chapter, which he just discussed, um, talking about, in some ways, the, this contradiction, this apparent contradiction in America of its racist past, obviously something that is very much uh, in the conversation today. And here again, I guess I, I'm, I, would, I just want to suggest or put on the table that maybe the contradiction isn't as, um, what seems to be a contradiction isn't as much of a contradiction as it might appear. So the, the idea of freedom, at least one idea of freedom that comes out of the, a certain strain of the Enlightenment, holds that human beings are free to the extent that they can be self-making. We are free if we can control and manage and achieve the ends of our lives through our own efforts. This is a radical idea of freedom uh, that you see expressed in certain kinds of you know, liberal thinkers from the beginnings of the liberal project. And from the very beginning of the liberal project, there were people who were identified who were not included in that understanding of what, what being a free person was. This was, uh, and I know the ambassador talks about this in the book, and we might disagree a bit about this, but this was the view, for example, of John Locke, an Enlightenment thinker, who when he looked at America said, America is filled with people who are not using their God-given rights to freedom to accumulate property, to develop an economy that's dynamic and leads to uh, a kind of pro economic progress of society. And he was talking about the Native Americans. That, uh, and when the American settlers come to, the, uh, come to America, in a sense, they begin with an assumption that these people who have lived here for a long time have not used this land in a way, have not used this wealth and this material in a way that actually is sort of a legitimate use of their freedom. And they can therefore be pushed constantly out of these places. And if you notice in the course of American history, those who have been defined outside of the circle of freedom as a form of self-making, those people, the populations have changed. First it was the Native Americans, then it was the Africans, then it was the Chinese or the Asians, then it was the Catholics. Until very recently, it was the unborn or the elderly or the infirm. There has always been a population at every point in American history where someone is defined outside of the circle of what is, in some ways, understood as the free and powerful self-making human being. So I think what seems like a contradiction, in fact, is more deeply connected. Uh, and it's something that we as a nation have not confronted because we don't see this deeper connection between our idea of freedom and who gets included in that circle of freedom. You know, it's interesting that you have to say that because it's a way of thinking. The Native Americans, I traveled the Rosebud Reservation, Pine Ridge Reservation, other reservations in South Dakota, in, the, in Utah, uh, Arizona, and the Native Americans don't believe that they don't use the nature to the extent as they have to use it. And okay, they are already the past. Some of my American critiques said that why do I pay attention, so much of attention for the way of thinking of the Native Americans? They are gone. Well, maybe. Uh, but I want to contrast the American way of thinking to the Hungarian way of thinking. And it's interesting that in our way of thinking, living here in the heart of Europe amongst much larger nations, like Russians, like Germans, like Turks, and, and uh, Slavic nations, in, in, in other words, uh, for the Russians. These nations and these powers have always been bigger than us. And it was a big chance, ha, 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 challenge for us how to preserve our way of life under the pressure. And i just give you one example. When I was ambassador in London, and the German ambassador, we, we are very close to the Germans. The German ambassador was a friend of mine and he kept coming to me in 2011 and he said that, you know, you should change your constitution. And I said, okay, is it a message from your government or you are telling this to me as a friend because if, if you tell me as an ambassador, I have to report it back to Budapest that it's a message. 
No, 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 it's, I'm just telling you. And uh, when he came to me third time, I, I tried to figure out how, how can I explain to him the Hungarian mindset. And I said that, you know, there were historic times when there were Hungarians who listened to the Germans and jumped on what they said. This happened, for example, in the 30s or the 40s. And we, did, we didn't come out very well from that. And I said that, okay, if you tell me the same thing five years down the road, I might consider. Because the solutions for our life is different than for your life. And, and if you take, for example, the German uh, position on migration or the German position of, on nuclear energy or green energy, it has, has been changing every second year. It's really hard to follow. And the same with the American policies. It's not only the, the political cycles, Democrats or Republicans. So what I am saying that it's the, the big question is whether any suggestion, any uh, opinion, be it that Lockean or Aristotelian or, or Augustian, is, is not a question of following a doctrine, but following what is whether it serves the human good of your citizens in a given historic moment. And this is what we are doing, and this is why we are criticized. Because we, Hungarians, and the government, and the prime minister, he says that, okay, let's see the facts. And any suggestion from Brussels, Washington, D.C., or wherever, should be uh, analyzed and decided based on whether it serves the human goods for the Hungarians. And obviously, we are, we are a member of the international community, so we don't want to do it in the, uh, uh, based on the expense on, on, on others. And, and this, is, this is what I think should be respected, and should be respected for the Native Americans and, and other people. We have to try, at least, to step into the uh, shoes of the other person. And I, I write about this in the book, that there, there is a moral price, and, and divine prize for your mistakes, for our mistakes. Dear Minister, thank you very much for reflecting on connections uh, with Hungary of this topic, and I would really like to return to that. Uh, but leading, leading on to, to this, uh, you mentioned two different kind of theological or political and theological sorts of thinking uh, happening in America, and this is very closely linked to the phenomenon of political polarization. So we can see that there have been uh, some sort of social consensus uh, in America on what liberty means or, what, or on what uh, different basic values mean. But uh, these consensus uh, uh, are, are seeing, are, we see that they are kind of failing uh, in uh, modern day American society. And so my question would be, what do you think the reasons can be and what the consequences will be if political polarization is not tackled somehow? So polarization, this word, is it the same in Hungarian? Yeah, yeah. It's Latin based. Pola, right. So it's, it comes from the word pol, which is a, re a reflection of basic geology of our planet, which we have two poles. There's the North Pole and the South Pole, or when you talk about a, you know, magnet, magnetism, you have the positive and the negative. And it seems to me that at any point in human history, you can look at any civilization, any country, any city, any political entity, there's always polarization. There's always um, a tension within the society. But that the, the nature of the polar opposition changes. It changes in different political contexts. It changes over time. You know, we could say that, uh, you know, sometimes we talk about the magnetic current changing, right? So I don't know, I don't know my geography that well, but, but we can talk about that, you know, the geologic shifts of our planet mean that sometimes the magnetic fields change. I think that's what's happening in America right now. It's not that we're experiencing polarization in a new, like that has never existed before. It's existed in our entire history. But the magnetic field is changing in America. There had been a fairly settled magnetic field, if I can put it that way, in the United States after World War II. 
And I would broadly describe it as a liberal, liberal polarization. We, we became very familiar uh, and we took for granted that the debate was within a kind of frame in which the optimal, the, the, the goal was shared. The, 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 the goal was shared, which was the, the fullest possibility of individual freedom, um, whether that was to be achieved through, uh, through, through the market, through the free markets, or through the assistance and support of the government through social programs. And that, de that defined the divide between the left and the right. And when you had debates, it would often come down to what should our tax rate be? <laughs> it, was not, it wasn't existential. But there's been a shift that's happened, um, certainly since the fall of the Soviet Union, the economic crisis of 2008. It relates to the deep economic divisions now we're experiencing. It also relates to those theological divisions I was describing. And what we no longer have is an agreement about uh, uh, that the, the optimal realization of human life is the, f the fullest expression of our individual freedom. In fact, I would say that we have a party increasingly that says we need more stability and security in our lives. Those who voted for Donald Trump, and I know probably some of you think, you know, who would ever vote for Donald Trump, but a lot of people voted for Donald Trump, and they voted for Donald Trump because they felt deep insecurity uh, economically and socially by all of the changes and transformations that were happening through economic globalization and social liberalization and the decay of the kinds of social structures that they could once rely upon, family, community, church, uh, and so forth. This deep insecurity wasn't a call for more individual liberty, it was a call for, we need help, we need stability, we need security, we need jobs, we need to know what our future looks like, we need a future for our children. So I think, that, I think there's been a shift in the magnetic field. And there are people who are nostalgic for the post-war division. Uh, this is sort of the never Trumpers. Uh, they want to reinstitute the old divisions. I don't think the old divisions are coming back. You can't change the magnetic fields. What we're going to have to come to, though, is a recognition that the divide that we have is a new divide, and it's going to require a different ability for us to be able to speak and debate and ultimately to compromise. So that will come not from the top down, it will come through the political process. So I don't mean to sound um, too hopeful because I do think it's a very challenging time. But I also think we need to recognize that polarization is natural and what we're going through right now is a shift of the polarities with the possibility of a new kind of settlement that we will someday look at as very stable. But at the moment looks very unstable. Um, dear Minister, I, uh, I would like to ask you as well about polarization, adding to the question that we can see that this new version of polarization, or at least in my opinion, but you can uh, contradict that, uh, are tearing apart societies in a way that we haven't seen at least in a while. And also, many say that it's not only in America, but also in many other democracies. Uh, in Hungary, for example, there is also a huge uh, social polarization with these party theological sorts of questions. So what do you think could be the solution for, not, for this not escalating? And who, who are the stakeholders who have responsibility for that? First of all, in terms of the analysis, of what is this situation? Uh, you know, your generations and the MCC generation, even your grandparents, but maybe your grandparents uh, still had some experience or stories from the Second World War or any war other than seeing on the TV screen. And we have lived uh, more than 70 years of, of a era of, of peace. Even under the communists or, or the uh, capitalism, it was still peaceful. So we kind of forgot the instinct to be ready for sudden changes. And polarization is a slow movement, but nowadays we have the war next door. 
But I, you should remember that 20 some years ago, in 1996, we had a war next door. The Yugoslavia, the, the, the Serbia-Croatia war, we together. Uh, and at that time, we, we didn't get that much ex excited than, than we do now. Then we have the inflation, we have the energy prices uh, just going through the roof. So we have lots of problems and people are exhausted and even more perplexed. What the heck is going on? And uh, what we need is basically cold blood. And this is, this is the responsibility of the leadership in a company, in a country, in a nation, that you have to step back. You don't have to jump on solving the problems. And maybe this is what's going on in the, in the US as well. And, and the US has a pretty good political process to, to, to settle these things, or at least take it apart so the big problem is, is cut into smaller ones and, and you can have small victories in solving a small part of it. You cannot do that with ultimate problems like what human life means. So I think uh, in each and every social entity or, or age in, in the human history, it depends how our leaders can comprehend the problems and act and organize uh, the tools and means what, what they have. Let me give you an example. We have this war in, in Ukraine. And now it's clear that this war cannot be ended unless the Americans or the Chinese step in into the negotiations with the Russians. The Russians don't see the Ukra Ukrainians or any European uh, as a credible partner. Uh, remember five years ago when the Russians invaded Crimea, then Angela Merkel, uh, President Sarkozy and Sikorsky, the for, uh, Polish foreign minister, they went to Moscow and talked. They talked, they established the Minsk ad agreement, but the Europeans couldn't deliver. So we are crippled and we are not taken seriously. So this is why we should keep an eye on the US as well, polarization here or there, or what, what we think about where culturally the US is going, because at least the US can assert some kind of uh, uh, solutions. And I agree, you know, I, I love the stoic uh, philosophers and I love the Indian philosophy and they have a, a pretty long view of history. The enlightenment thinking, what we are grown into, is, is good for short-term problems. But for long-term problems, we need Aristotle and Seneca and Epictetus and, and kind of people like that. Okay, so uh, we are shortly uh, approaching the end of the discussion. I would like to open up one uh, more topic, which is uh, pretty much worth discussing, which is uh, how America relates to Europe or how Europe should relate to America. Because uh, you also write in your book that the film about Europe's future is being made in America, and uh, many people are envisioning uh, a Europe who, uh, with a kind of similar political uh, organization as the United States with all the different European states together. We know that debate very well from uh, all the different medias. So how, so how do you think, uh, dear minister, that uh, America can, so do you think that America can serve as an example for Europe? And if so, in what aspects? I don't believe in, in a federal Europe, similar to the United States, because the historic roots of, of Europe is entirely different from the US. In the US, there was a rational process to establish a, a new order, or ordered liberty. While in Europe, we have different histories and we grown up in the idea of subsidiarity, that we have to solve problems where it occurs and where the most information are available to solve that problem. And 
you know, the Americans say, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. And in the US, actually one of the polarization is uh, between the federal government and the, and the local authorities. And, and we don't even hear how many debates, how many uh, collisions uh, are going on there. And, and the, in the US, what made the US great is the subsidiarity. Subsidiarity was uh, historically. And now, as, as decisions are, are, are centralized in Washington DC, K Street, L Street, <laughs> and some offices, that, that, that is killing the United States. And I don't think that Europe needs it. And uh, well, I am just a minister, but only over my dead body. So the question was, what can Europe learn from America? Let me, let me reverse the question. This is what I do, which is uh, to always challenge the question, which is I actually think now, in a way, the United States uh, is in a position to learn something um, I'm not going to say Europe. I'm actually going to say Hungary. I just finished the last set of comments was a reflection that Americans, um, ordinary average Americans, average citizens, are feeling a deep sense of insecurity. And they're feeling this insecurity because of the political settlement in which one party was the party of globalized free markets and the other party was the party of complete and thorough individual freedom, especially in the sexual realm. And that's been the American political settlement for the last 30 or 40 years. And the reaction against this settlement by ordinary Americans was a demand for more stability, more order, more predictability. You don't look to Europe for that necessarily, but you can look to one country in Europe for examples of that, which is Hungary. Hungary has actually been the, the singular and distinct nation throughout Europe, which has offered to its citizenry a kind of order in a world of disorder, of economic disorder and of familial and social disorder. I just came from a meeting with your prime minister with a number of other guests who are here at the festival. And we came away thinking, can we borrow him for a few years uh, in the United States? Uh, because everything he said made enormous sense in terms of what is the role of the government and the public order in supporting the possibility of ordinary individuals, ordinary people to live lives of order and security and stability. So I actually think um, this explains, among other things, why so many people from the United States have been coming to this little country in Central Europe to learn something that we may have forgotten, uh, which is um, the nature of politics is about affording the possibility of human flourishing to every individual, regardless of your social and economic status. That's something it seems that we've forgotten in America for the last 50 years, but I think we have something to learn. So maybe in another year or two, we might sit here to discuss a book that I will write called The Hungarian Genius. Uh, let, let, me, no, let me just uh, ask one last question from the minister, which I'm personally really interested in, which is shortly, do you regard uh, any sort of American policy or institution as a kind of model for, uh, for Hungary in your ministerial work? So either use policy, and uh, supporting entrepreneurships or uh, higher education, or do you see an American model, which is an example for you? I give you just one example. This week I visited ELTE, one of our best universities. They have a brilliant uh, natural science department and they, you know, in quantum communications and uh, computing, there are three nations that are big. The US, China, and the French. And we now developing a Hungarian uh, uh, knowledge center, I would say, and we as government, we finance it for quantum communications and who owns and who, who controls the, the technology, who understands the comprehend the technology, those will be the winners for the future. And I, I told them only one thing, that in the US, if you have an idea, then you, you will find some finance to, to bring it to a, a viable product, and then you will have finance to make it a mass product. And this is what we are not good as Hungarians. And the Americans are best of the world. 
I wish that we would be so good in technology that when you have an idea, you have the, the trial product, you have the final product, and then you go and be that intellectual product, service, or, 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 or tangible good. So this is what I, I admire, and, and partly this is why I, I took this, op this challenge to be a minister, and ha having been responsible for innovation, I will push it. I would say ruthlessly. That like in soccer or basketball, you can move around in, in the field, in the court, but finally, what decides whether you are successful or not, not whether you score a goal or not. And, and this is the time to score a goal. Th this is what I, some people say that I learned it in, in the US, but I'm deep-rooted Hungarian. We are fighters and we had to fight. We, have to, we had to win and in the future, we have to win and preserve our way of life. Thank you. Dear Minister, dear Professor, thank you for joining us today.